for all the you guys who found the room and came early, I'm going to get started here because uh, we'll get through the bio and stuff while we're waiting for the rest of the crowd to show up. And the team will take care of that for me. Uh, and I can't see the chat. So Sankop, you can, if there's anything urgent, you can uh, interrupt me. Or if someone has an, it, it, it's a workshop. So if someone has a, uh, a comment to make, uh, and you think it's worth interrupting, please, by all means, interrupt and, and let's have a chat. All right, so uh, the topic is California capitalism and really what's wrong with California capitalism, not, not just what it is. Uh, my name is Looney and here's why you should listen to me. Here's why uh, I have some credentials to talk about this topic. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I've been an entrepreneur since 1992. I used to be a software entrepreneur. I worked in tech. Uh, here in Seattle, I built five software companies, four of which were backed by uh, venture capitalists from California. So I've played the game with California capitalism and California VCs. I know how it works. I've taken their money. I've made them some money. I've lost them some money. Uh, and then my career shifted uh, eight years ago in 2012. I started teaching. Uh, by that time, I thought I knew something about entrepreneurship, so I started teaching entrepreneurship at a business school called Bainbridge Graduate Institute. Uh, soon after that, I launched a what's now Global Accelerator Network called Fledge. Uh, this year, I launched something called Africa Eats. You'll see that in the, uh, in the talk, uh, and a nonprofit called Realize Impact. And in doing all that, became you know jumped over the over the table and started being an investor as well as an entrepreneur. Fledge is this global network of impact accelerators, business accelerators that focus on companies that do good in the world, mission-driven for-profits. Again, we started here in Seattle. We now have partners around the world. Uh, if any of you are looking to build accelerators or have one you want to make better, uh, we're always looking for more, more partners in more parts of the world uh, to help more entrepreneurs. And our latest effort here in the middle of a global pandemic is a holding company that takes 27 of our graduates. And I'll tell you why about that uh, in about, I don't know, half hour, 40 minutes. All right, jumping into the depths of this topic, California capitalism, this book, this book here explains the problem at hand, which is really strange because this book has nothing to do with economics or business or investing or entrepreneurship. This is actually a book that talks about the history of science. When I do this talk in person, I've done this talk many, many times. Uh, when I do it in person, just picture a room with a hundred people in it. And I say, who's read this book? And like two hands go up. Uh, but what's really interesting about this book is that everybody in the room knows what's in it. Everybody has heard the essence that Thomas Kuhn wrote about in the sixties. This book's old. This book's not, not a new book. This is from 60, 65, 66, something like that. It's actually a book older than me. All right, and the, the key idea in this book is the idea of a paradigm. And you're going, of course, I know what a paradigm is. I, I hear that word every day. And so specifically, what Thomas Kuhn said in the, in the Structure of Scientific Revolutions is that a paradigm is a set of beliefs. And it's a set of beliefs that are used to filter the evidence that comes in. And he was talking about science. So this works everywhere else, but he was talking about how science works. So you believe, for example, that the sun goes around the earth because you've seen that every single day when the sun comes out, you see that the sun moves around the earth, you're sitting still. It's obvious, right? And that was the paradigm for thousands of years, maybe hundreds of thousands or million years that, that we were the center of the universe and the sun moved around us. And then new evidence shows up. Right, so we got telescopes and we got actually before telescopes, we had evidence that these, these things moving around didn't move in circles and we couldn't explain how they moved. And well, what do you do when you have evidence that, that doesn't match this paradigm, this set of beliefs? You ignore it. Now we all think that, okay, we, we, you know, we look at it and question and whatnot, but that's not how science actually works. When you get new evidence that does not fit your paradigm, you throw it away and ignore it. You push it away and say, no, can't be true. And you keep doing that as a group, you know, individually and as a group until there's so much evidence that you just can't keep doing that, that you have to do something else. So let's talk about this paradigm of California VC investing, right? So it's not California capitalism as in a different way to do capitalism. 
That's just a shortcut that I found on the internet for this paradigm of how you invest in startups. So if we talked to a California VC, if we grabbed someone either from California or someone following their model, which is almost every investor in the world, they would tell you that they're seeking a giant opportunity, a multi-billion dollar opportunity that they're looking for only companies that can grow really fast, two to three, two to three times year over year, not counting the first year or two when you're gonna grow even faster. <clears throat> but you're looking for a humongous opportunity like search or social media or self-driving cars or something of that magnitude. And you wanna go and grab the market uh, you need a great team to go execute it. If you ask investors what they invest in, they always say it's team, 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 but they never actually state these first two assumptions that's built into the paradigm. They just assume you're playing the same game they are, and not all of us are. All right, now, also what they don't state, right, publicly, uh, until you fill them with drinks and talk to them, is what they really need is all this, and they need a plan that can burn a lot of capital in their fund. So it doesn't matter how big the VC funds are, they tend to make 15 to 20 investments, which means if it's a billion dollar fund, they gotta take a 20th of that money, $200 million, and they have to go spend it on one company. And if they have a million dollar fund, well, then they gotta go and put you know, $200,000 to work at one company. I forgot that 20 is wrong. I think that's five and, and five, you know, 50 million and five million. Anyway, <clears throat> they gotta go burn a lot of money is also part of their paradigm. Now, the one thing they will talk about over and over and over again are exits. And an exit these days in the 2020s uh, is an acquisition, rarely an IPO. Uh, but in the, in the old days, it used to be an IPO. It used to be three rounds of capital, and then you went IPO, and you did that all in five years, and everybody was happy. Then the dot-com bubble blew that up. These days, it's taking more than 10 years. Facebook it was 10 years between the time they they incorporated in the time they went public. Google was eight years, I think it was, and that was 15 years ago. Uh, it's just taking longer and longer and longer. But in this paradigm, there has to be an acquisition or an IPO for the investors to get their money back. This has been going on, not forever. This idea of venture capital, the way it's done today, is not ancient history. It was not done in Rome this way. It was not done in the British Empire this way. It was not done in the Chinese empire this way or in the Indian, Indians uh, before the British showed up. Uh, this has only been going on since the late 40s. We know who the first venture capital was, venture capitalist was. It was this guy. His name is Georges Durot, born in France, came to the US uh, between the wo world wars. And he is the first venture capitalist. That's one of the books that's, that's written about him because he really was the first venture capitalist in the modern era in the United States and anywhere. He ran a company called American Research and Development. It was founded in 1946. It was the major investor in Digital Equipment Corporation. If you're not old enough to know what that is. That's kind of the next, that's the in-between wave of mini computers between the IBM mainframes and the personal computers. It was huge, it was a gigantic company. Anyway, American Research and Development was a, a VC firm, and it ultimately was actually run in a slightly different manner, and it was acquired by a big conglomerate in 1972. So basically, had a run until 1972, and then it was dissolved. What came out of that was a whole bunch of other funds that look exactly like we're still doing today. The first of which was Davis and Rock. In fact, it was in California. That's Davis and Rock. Uh, I don't remember Davis's first name, it's Arthur Rock. Uh, they moved to Silicon Valley. They funded Fairchild, which was basically the first startup uh, tech firm that made actual silicon chips. Uh, and then what came out of Fairchild was Intel. They were the main funders of Intel. Uh, their first fund did really well, their second fund did not. Uh, and it was a tiny fund at the time. Just, this, is, this, is, this is just play money in, in modern era days. It was a $3 million fund. And even American research and development was like a five, five, ten million dollars of, of capital. It was small. Uh, Rock, uh, Arthur Rock later went on and funded Apple as an as a, uh, angel investor. Their practices that they did back in the 60s are still followed today, more or less. 
Uh, these two guys met at Harvard Business School. George Durow was the most famous uh, at the time, most famous and beloved professor at Harvard Business School back at that era. Uh, and American Research and Development is where a bunch of other VC firms spun out of. Greylock, their founders worked there. Um, and so basically all the VCs from the Boston area, New York and California got their start either uh, from this firm, from this professor or from people who worked there. And just to put this in context of what we're talking about in time, this is kind of the same era of the Beatles, right? The Beatles were on Ed Sullivan in 63. The Republic of Kenya was not, you know, was, was independent in 63. So we're kind of talking about the era of independence across Africa. That's the age you should think of when we think about venture capital. And it was young and new and still figuring itself out until the 80s and 90s. It wasn't a big industry until the early 90s. The dot-com bubble was where it really took off and went the wrong direction, but that's a whole other story. All right, so what are we talking about in terms of, uh, of investing here? We're talking about early stage investing and if we split that into four parts, it's, it's arguable how you split this apart, but let's just talk about four parts of early stage investing. We're talking about the seed round or the early growth stage, somewhere in there, the, the time when the first outside money starts flowing into companies. And this is getting later and later uh, as time goes on, but we'll ignore that fact. Um, right now, if you talk to entrepreneurs, there's plenty of them at Songkalp. Uh, most of them are sitting in the valley of death. Most of them are out looking for funders, don't have it. A lot of those uh, entrepreneurs will die sitting in the valley of death, not being funded. Uh, that's literally what we call it. Uh, it's, a, it's a horrible time to be an entrepreneur. Anyway, uh, if you're an investor, you're looking for companies at that stage and what you want out of them is to invest. In, you wanna own some equity in them. that's part of the paradigm. So let's use this, this uh, chart here you're going to see variations of this graph a few times. Uh, how this works is this big green blob here, it's not the scale, uh, is money being handed over from the investor to the entrepreneur, to the company. So there's some money going in. And then we have this gray line here, which is showing how the company is growing. So we got a, a nice hockey stick here, not too steep. Uh, and then if it's an equity investment, what's interesting is there's nothing here. This is all blank because you're not buying any cash flows. You're, you're not buying any, you know, there's, there's no dividends being paid in startups. So you don't get any dividends. You don't get any interest payments. There's nothing that you get except a percentage of the company. And then you get paid back when someone else comes along and buys the equity from you, right? And typically that's an acquisition where they're buying all the equity. And so they're buying all the equity. Some of it's yours as the investor and you get back some return. What's strange about that in terms of structure is that you're basically not being promised anything for any, any unknown period of time. We have a handshake, right? So we have a handshake that says, we wanna exit this company. We want this company acquired as, quick, as quickly as possible. That handshake used to be five-ish years and then it became seven years. And these days it's kind of like 10 years. We hope in 10 years, these companies get, get purchased but there's actually no promise. There's no written agreement that says in 10 years, someone's gonna buy this company. All right, so there's one more piece of this paradigm, which you may have heard of. So if you hang around investors, you will hear the, the name or the number 10X repeated a lot. So 10X as in the value I pay for the company now, the value when it's acquired needs to be 10X higher or more, more is better. Uh, but at least it needs to be at least 10x. Uh, I taught once at a, uh, uh, an it was a one day event for lawyers, specifically startup lawyers, uh, because to be a lawyer in the United States, you have to take some continuing education classes. And they just had us who do this for a living come in and, and speak in front of them. That was con considered continuing ed. I found it interesting just to see it from that framework. So I stayed the whole day. And the number 10X was repeated uh, over, over a six hour period. It was repeated approximately a thousand times, uh, maybe 1200 times or 1500 times. It was like every two minutes, every two minutes for six hours, somebody said 10X or exit. Um, so where does this come from? Why, why is this 10X built into this paradigm? Why is it so pervasive 
that when you sit around with investors, they're just going to assume 10x or, or better, or they don't want to invest. All right, so why 10x? It comes to this chart. So this was given to me by the most prolific angel investor in Seattle, uh, who's now a VC, full, full scale VC. And this is what he told me, which other people have told me since then. Uh, this is what a successful venture capital or angel uh, portfolio looks like per 10 investments. And so if you're an angel, you may have only made 10 investments. If you're a VC, you may make 15 or 20 per fund. But let's do, do the math per 10 because it's easier. So one out of 10 times, this is how you read this. One out of 10 times, you hit a home run. Everything's in baseball terms for some reason. I'll, I'll translate that. That's good. So one out of 10 times, you got a 10X or better. Two out of 10 times, you did okay. And literally that's, that's how they'll speak. It was okay. You know, it was a 5X, a 6X, 7X, you know, 3X. Oh God, yeah, it was fine. I got a 3X out of it. Um, if it's not 10X, it's not good, right? So you do okay. Two out of 10 times, you get some money out. Uh, three out of 10 times, you get exactly what you put in, more or less, could be a little bit less. Uh, often it's exactly what you put in because there's a, what's called a preference in the deal that says I get, investors get their money back first, right? Exactly what they put in first. So there's a small acquisition. Often the investors will get back exactly what they put in or, or you know, 90 cents on the dollar, 80 cents on the dollar, so, something about that. That's, you know, that's not good. Right? It's better if you put your money in the bank and it earns some interest than you just get your money back you know, three years later. Uh, and four out of 10 times, you get nothing. You get nothing because the company crashed and burned. You get nothing because the company stopped growing. Nobody wants to acquire it and it becomes a zombie. It becomes a perfectly good company paying all its employees, but it's not growing, so it has no value. And so it's a terrible investment. Um, you know, lots of reasons why there's zeros. More often than not, it's just because the company failed. All right, so if you just look at this as a whole from, from far enough away, something odd shows up, right? So uh, professional VCs, the best venture capital firms in the world do this, right? And they only, they're only, they get to see the best deals and they're only right three out of 10 times. So seven out of 10 times, the California VCs are wrong with their investments that they're losing money on their investments seven out of 10 times. And the real numbers are actually slightly worse than that. Um, but you know, more or less three out of 10 times. And if we do a little math to see, well, what's this return in cash? Because uh, VCs do simple math. We'll just do cash on cash return. Well, if one out of 10 returns 10, 10X, so that's your money back, right? So 10X times 10%, one out of 10 is a one. So that's getting your capital back. And then two out of 10 gets you 5X. So that's good. That gets you some, some more profits. Three out of 10 gets you a little bit more, 30% times one. And 40% of zeros. When you add all that together, you get 2.3. And so is that what VCs make? Well, it's hard to tell. Um, they don't like to tell us those numbers. What we do know is this study, this is a study of angels, not VCs, but one of the questions out there was, can angels make the same returns as VCs? And this study said yes. Uh, and it had some data about VCs, but mostly it was about 6,000 angel investments. And if you had invested in all of them, you would have made 2.6 times your money back. And it would have taken you, this is pretty old data. It would have taken you on average three and a half years to get any money back. But most of those money back were uh, less than one X return. And there were a couple investments in this portfolio that better than 30X, some between 10 and 30. But overall, the key, the key information here is you know, about two and a half times. So the real goal, the real goal for VCs is not a 10X return. It's a 10X return on a subset of their investments. The real goal is about two and a half times their money back, two and a half times cash on cash. If you can do that, you are a successful venture capitalist or a successful angel. Right, plus or minus a half. You can get two, that's fine. You get three X, even better. Um, you know, you're not expected to make more than three X. It happens sometimes, right? Whoever invested in Facebook and Google made more than that in their fund. But uh, in general, two and a half times is a good return. 
So why two and a half times? Why is that considered good? Well, when you do the math on two and a half times, it's a yeah, 15, 20% internal rate of return. And that's better than the public markets. So ultimately, the whole thing that boils down from this 10x is the idea that if you take more risk, you should get a higher return. And venture capital is higher risk than you know, private equities is more risk than public equities. And so you should get a higher return, a higher return, 15 to 20%. Over 10 years, that is about two and a half times your money back. All right, and does it work? No. So um, this is a real re result. I don't have the citation on here, but uh, fewer than half of the VCs out there. This is real data. It's very hard. Again, it's really hard to find. Uh, half of the VCs, professional VCs out there, did not return 1x on their, on their fund. Another 35% didn't return 2x. Uh, if you can't do 2x in uh, in 10 years or 12 years or 15 years, whatever the lifetime winds up being, uh, again, those those investors should have just put their money in an index fund. 15% uh, did what they were supposed to do. And 5% returned more than 3x. And they returned so much capital that investors are still putting new capital into venture capital more and more every year. All right. So that's the background on what paradigm we're stuck in. And the question is, is there another way out? Is there another solution? Is there anything this book can tell us? Well, before we go there, we got to um, look at the elephant in the room, which is debt. So if you go through everybody who's who signed up to SongCalp and you go through all the investors and you look at how many say they're, they're debt investors versus equity, I'm not sure they asked that question in the profile, but you can, you can see the word debt show up many, many times in, the, in those profiles. Uh, you will see that debt is much more common than equity in this crowd. And one of the reasons is there just aren't acquisitions in India or Africa. Uh, there aren't IPOs and therefore that's not a good thing to do, right? Put your money down and hope that something happens someday in the future. And the only other way that most people know of to invest is debt. So just for those who, who've never seen it, here's, this, here's a debt investment in my, my same graph. So you hand over some money from investor to company. They actually promise you something. They promise to make a series of payments. Usually it's the same size payments over a certain period of time. And the problem is, the reason why debt is failing as a, as a mechanism for, for funding SMEs and startups is, well, we want them to grow. Right? We're giving them money to grow. Uh, the companies I work with, we do want them to double, triple in size, just not necessarily in a year. Uh, and so as they grow, these payments become affordable, but they're not affordable to start with. They're more than the company can afford. So what do we have to do? We have to give them a honeymoon period and push out these payments a bit. And then we take more risk. And then really, we got to add more interest rate in order to make up for that risk. And ultimately, we're not going to get two and a half times our money here because that would be 250% interest or it would be a long, a long series of payments at pretty high interest. So ultimately, we wind up in this vicious circle where we need to charge more in order to make our two and a half times, but we, they can't afford more because the more we increase it, the more payments are unaffordable. Uh, we could try it, but we'll just find that our default rates go up and up and up. And so debt doesn't really work. It works for uh, philanthropists who are doing, uh, doing work without regard to whether or not they make money. It works later in the life, life cycles of the company when they're up and running for, let's say, five or six years. And they have a track record and they have some assets to, to back up their loans. But I'm talking about that little sweet spot of the valley of death. That's not going to solve that problem. There's no way to actually make the numbers work. So what we really need is the other part of the book, which is the paradigm shift. We've all heard that word. All that really means is that we have to incorporate this, this, uh, this knowledge and this experience and these facts into our system. And we need to come up with a new system, right? Simple as that. We need a new system, which is a new paradigm, just to be clear. We're not gonna throw away paradigms. We're gonna create a new paradigm. And I'm gonna show you two, in fact, uh, that are new ways to invest in companies and they both work. So two solutions, and let me go through them one at a time here. 
So the first one is a family of investment style. They're both families, they're, they're not point solutions. Uh, family of investing style called revenue-based finance. So here's that chart again, and here's how it works this time. So investors hand over some money, revenues are growing, and as we can see, the payments back kind of mirror that company revenue line. So in general, what we're talking about doing is asking the company to pay us a percentage of their revenues. This is also called royalties sometimes in the world. I'm from Seattle, here we call it revenue-based finance. Other places in the world call it other things. And so we're asking them to pay us a percentage of their revenues. So we know they can pay it because they earned it. This is earned money, not grants, not investment money, money from customers, real revenues. And we're gonna ask them to pay us, not for a specific amount of time, we're gonna ask them to pay us for a certain amount of money. So let me show you what this looks like. There's, there's three main ways to do this. Simplest is just a straight up revenue share agreement. I will give you $100,000 and you promise to pay me 5% of your future monthly revenues. And you're gonna keep doing that until I get back, let's say $200,000. That would be a two X return. If I asked you for $250,000, that would be a 2.5 X return. If I asked you for 300,000, that would be a three X return. All the numbers in bold and underline are the variables. And so let's just look at this one. It's 100,000 in, 200,000 back, <clears throat> and 5% of monthly revenues. We could do this as a loan. So that wasn't a loan. That was just money changing hands back and forth. To make it a loan requires a time period and an interest rate. That's what a loan is. So I didn't change anything on the top. All I did to make it a loan was I added an extra part to the contract that said, you have a deadline to pay this. Seven years, 10 years, 15 years, and you have a minimum payment to make that's based on the amount of money I gave you. Uh, so this is what we do in the US with a revenue-based loan. We throw it on as often nine years with the IRS minimum interest rate on. And now it's a loan. Um, and when it's a loan, it comes with all the things that come around with loans, like, well, what if you don't pay? If you don't pay as a lender, right? As, as me and my investor shoes, as a lender, I can throw you into bankruptcy, right? I can petition the court and request that we have a bankruptcy court take over and a trustee will pay me by selling assets or handing me the company, right? You can't get that with a revenue, with just a revenue share. That's not a lender, that's just a, uh, you know, a contract relationship. Third way to do this is the way I do this, which is the way, way I do it more often than not, which is a little strange twist. It's revenue-based equity. Uh, and my fund is the largest user of revenue-based equity in the world. Other funds do revenue-based loans. So here's how it works as equity, right? And I'll just go flip back and forth. It changes a little bit, but not that much. So let's just say the same $100,000. This time it buys a certain number of shares. And in this case, we're gonna talk about the shares and percentages, but just keep in mind that when you buy 10% of a company, you're buying a specific number of shares. That, that percentage just happens to be what comes out of the math. If someone else buys more shares later, you get diluted and all that. But you're buying a certain number of shares and the company is promising to buy back maybe half the shares. That's what it says here. It could be three quarters of the shares. It could be all the shares. I like half, right? When I do these deals, I do half. So they promised to buy back half of my shares for, in this case, $200,000. And where's the revenue show up? Well, the revenue determines how many shares to buy back. So we look at the quarterly revenues. We multiply that by, in this case, 5%. And then we divide by the share price that gets us $200,000. And that, that we then do that transaction. And we do that every quarter until we run out of shares. So it has a max to it because it has a price per share and a number of shares. And this deal would return 2x and then some, whereas if we did this as a loan, it would be 2x exactly. And the reason why it, there's an and then some, there's a, there's a plus sign there, is because we still own half the shares. And so then my contracts would have provisions for what to do with the other half of the shares. Could be that we just wait, just like a normal equity investor. Uh, that's not what we do. What we do is we say after a certain number of years, you have to buy back those shares too for whatever they're worth then, not whatever we put into the contract here. So hopefully the value of those shares went up. 
And then we have an agreement that they have to buy the shares, um, not in one lump sum, uh, in a manner that we'll discuss at that time, but no slower than this deal here. So if we were doing a 5% buyback, we'll do a 5% buyback on those shares unless you want to buy them back quickly. All right, and that's it. Those are the three main ways to do this. It's mostly done as debt and equity. I found one firm in the world that just does, I think it's two firms in the world that just do rev shares. Uh, the key variables is really just two. Um, once you pick debt or equity, uh, or either, with, no matter whether you pick debt or equity, there's two key variables. One is percentage. What percentage of revenues you're going to take? The norm is a single digit percentage. And what's your return on investment? In this stage that we're talking about, it's typically 2x. I've seen deals that are one and a half. I've seen deals that are 1.2, usually a little bit later as, as in growth stage. Sometimes I've seen them in impact investing where it's just lower because they, they uh, discount for impact. But in, in usually around 2x. That, that's a good place just to, to start with. And then the deals can have anything else on them, just like any other early stage investment. So besides debt or equity, uh, you can have this residual equity piece. So that's why I like the, the half buyback is equity so that there's upside in case something good happens in terms of acquisitions. Uh, I've seen revenue-based loans that have warrants attached to them. It's more complicated, but it's been done. Uh, I've seen deals where the buybacks are not mandatory, where they're optional on either side, I've seen them. Uh, and then every other preference that you've seen on a early stage investment like board seats, liquidation preference, uh, drag along rights, all, all that other stuff. I've seen that all on these deals as well. Okay, so let's walk through one of these. So let's just assume you found a deal, maybe you find it this week. Uh, you like the team, you like the product or service, you do your due diligence, everything's good. You're all ready to do one of these investments. How do you pick these two variables, percent and, and payback? So let's just do one with a spreadsheet and I'll show you how I do it. Uh, so let's just assume for the sake of this exercise that here are the revenue projections. And it's really rare that you're gonna get 10 years of projections. Usually you don't get more than five. So rough, you're gonna to have to do some, some guesswork yourself. In this case, we just stopped growing at year seven just to see what happens. So there's a spreadsheet here. If you're looking for it, you can find it off of this uh, website down here, um, not in real time, but afterwards. Uh, so let's just, Look here, and I'll show you how to, how to fill this out. We'll go in little by little. So at the top, we have the total investment. It's $100,000. And we're going to do plug in 2x. And it's going to compute for us 200000 which seems silly. But you know, if you're doing 1.2 and you're doing a $137,000 loan, it's nice that it computes it for you. Um, in these columns, we're going to put in the projected revenues. And in this case, and when you're doing this for real, it's your projected revenues, not the ones they give you, right? You're an investor. You know they're, they're going to be optimistic because they're entrepreneurs. I know this because I'm an optimistic, optimistic entrepreneur. Put in the numbers you think are going to happen. And we're just going to look at 10 years because no one's going to invest more than 10 years. Uh, this column is just going to compute some growth so we can make sure that these numbers look reasonable, right? This is, this is an anti-hockey stick. This is a nice company that slowly slows down its growth over time. Okay, that's in that column and that's automatically computed. All right, and then the interesting columns are these four over here. So uh, I4 here is just a number we're gonna pick out of thin air that says, let's try, let's look what happens if we take 3% of revenue. So here's what happens in terms of the cash flows. In year one, you give out $100,000 and the spreadsheet's doing annual redemptions just because the math's easier and fits on a screen. And this is because it's shorter. Um, so $100,000 in year one goes out. At the beginning of year two, you get paid 3% of last year's revenues, right? You can't get paid this year's revenues. You get paid la last year's. You get paid with historic revenues always. Um, and so you get 3% of their last year's revenues. That's $7,500. Spreadsheet calculates that for you. And then $10,500 is 3% of 350, dollars 15,000% of 500 and onward. Uh, and it just keeps doing this. And at the bottom, it will sum up what the total is over 10 years. And in this case, it's not quite as much as we were hoping for. 
Uh, and this column here, this row here computes the internal rate of return. So this would be a 12.4% deal if you took it, but it's not our 2X that we were aiming for. So let's keep trying. So next column over, let's try another scenario. Let's try 5%. And so 12,500 is now 5% of 250. Everything else is just, uh, plays off of that. Uh, and you can see it, it gets to zero, right? The, the spreadsheet's smart enough to know when we hit the target we were aiming for, in this case, 200K. Uh, and so it adds up to 200,000, right? Just like we wanted. This is to basically just check, check numbers, just to make sure. Uh, and the internal rate of return of these cash flows is 17.4%. So now we're in that sweet spot. We're between 15 and 20. We're right where we want to be. So let's just keep looking. So let's try 7%. Let's see what happens if we take 7%. Now, do note, when we say we're taking, we're taking off of top line revenues, there's a long discussion on why that is. We'll see if we have time for that. Um, uh, it's the easiest one to work with. If we're taking 5% uh, of top line revenues, then we're really taking 5% of net margins as well, we're taking 5% of the profits. So if the company isn't earning more than 5% on the bottom line, then you're taking all the profits or more than all the profits. So you have to keep in mind how profitable these companies are, 7% starts to be a lot, right? You need a company that's having like 21% net margins. So you're only taking a third of them, right? If, if they're only making 10, you're taking too much. Anyway, so 7% gets us paid back. And in this case, we can start looking at how long so you can see that 5% uh, took you know, seven and a half years. This last payment's smaller than that payment. Uh, and 7% took ooh, six and a half years. So now you can start to say, well, 21%, that's nice. Um, maybe that's a little bit too much in terms of 7%. And you know, how long am I willing to wait to get fully paid back right, or paid back twice over? Uh, we can start to look at how long it takes to get your capital back and whatnot. But you know, do I want to wait seven or eight years? Maybe I'm not that patient. So let's do one more column. And the last column is 9% here. Uh, and 9% gets us paid back in six years. So now we have some numbers to play with. There's no reason these have to be odd. We could put in, you know, if we, if we think the answer is somewhere between five and seven, we can put in six and see what happens. We could put in 5.5 .5 and see what happens. <clears throat> it doesn't have to be an even number either or, or whole number. And so you play around with those numbers <clears throat> and, you know, five minutes later, you get a feel for where, uh, where the payoffs feeling right to you based on this multiple and this time frame to get fully paid back and something clicks and you go, let's go with that. Let's, let's toss that out. And so that's what we do for real. When we do this, it, it, now I've done so many, it takes me like two minutes, put it in number pops out, that looks reasonable, let's go with that. Uh, and then it comes down to, if we were doing this in person, I would now like go into little breakouts and around tables. Uh, if we have time at the end, we can try that, but uh, um, I doubt it. So just take a moment, right? I know that's a lot of information, but take a moment for a second and think about if you were to do one of these deals for a company with these cash flows and you had $100,000 to do this, how would you do it? Would you, would you go down the debt route or the equity route? which of these four choices would you make? Three, five, seven, or nine percent or something in between? 2x the right number for you or is that too high or is that too low? Are these IRRs too high or too low for you? Which column do you, do you like best? Uh, and what else do you need? If you're the investor in one of these deals, what else do you need to put into the deal? You want a board seat? Do you need a whole bunch of covenants, right? The approvals on, on things that the company's doing? Do you want a right to buy more shares? Do you want a right to do another round? Um, do you want to give them time before they start paying you? It's called a honeymoon. What happens if the company gets purchased? Do you want to immediately get paid or you just want them to keep paying you? You want more upside? So I'm just gonna give you two seconds while I take another drink. So like any early stage deal, there's a whole bunch of other things to worry about. But what's novel here is that it's just a percentage of revenues and a return. Um, before I jump to the next one, and that's it. And just be clear, this works for any company that earns revenues and ultimately eventually makes a profit. It doesn't have to be profitable to start with. 
because right? they're just using your revenues to get there. They're sorry, they're using your capital to get there. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. The equity investments do the same thing. They don't have to be profitable to take your equity investment. So as long as it can earn revenues, you can get paid back. So where does this not work? I've been asked that many times. Uh, it doesn't work in uh, medical companies where you know, you're developing a drug and you're going to get acquired if the trials work, but you're never going to have a dime of revenue uh, before you get acquired. There's no need to do that in this. That, that's really just a lottery ticket investment. Uh, this, does, this works, but shouldn't be used if you have, in fact, the next Google in front of you. Just invest in them and wait 10 years and let them go public and make a lot of money. You don't need to get payback early on that if you're absolutely sure it's the next Google. Everything else, this works great. So you got an SME and they're, you know, they're making a small amount of money in a village scale business, fine, right? There's a, there is a number at the top. Ooh, there's a number in terms of how much money you can put in based on what their profits are to, to take out, let's say a third of their profits as repayments. There's, a, there's an investment to be had there. Um, so you could do micro lending for little businesses using the system. And I've seen a firm out of London where their minimum check size is $5 million. You can do this for, for vastly big deals as well. Um, this is in fact the way that most films are financed. It's the way that a lot of oil wells are financed and mines. Uh, it works at scale. It works in big numbers and it works in little numbers too. All right, so that's one solution and it's been working. I've been using it for eight years. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about it afterwards, but let's talk about one more structure that uh, I've just started using that's totally different in terms, it feels like it's within the paradigm, but it's not. <clears throat> and so it's called permanent capital. And it has a very, very strange look uh, on my graph here. You put in money to a company, nothing happens. There's no promises and nothing will ever happen with that money ever in terms of this picture. Um, but there's a reason to do this. All right, and so the, the fundamental ideas inside of this other, other solution is that ownership should be perpetual, or ownership is perpetual, right? So when you buy equity in, in a, if you buy land, it's your land forever, right? No one takes it from you. If you buy shares in a public company, you own shares in a public company for hundreds of years until, unless they go out of business or get purchased. So what if investments were forever? What if the idea was that you were going to put money in a company and that company was going to last forever and your investment was going to last forever? When you start down that path, you start to think about separating the, what the investors want and their timeline from what the company wants and their timeline. So typically investors want some money back, right? They want a return on investment. And startups, when you talk to most startups, most entrepreneurs in the world, they don't want to be acquired. That's the California idea. There are certainly there are entrepreneurs that want that, but far more entrepreneurs, 90 something percent of all entrepreneurs in the world want to build something that lasts. And so why are we taking this short, short term thinking from the VCs and mapping it on top of entrepreneurs that don't want it? That, that's, that's silly. So in again, going down this, this rabbit hole here, well, why do we even want the ROI? We want the ROI because we want money, because we like to be able to say that we, we have the most money when we die, when in fact it's the most value when you died or the most value you have when you're not dead or while you're still alive, that really matters. Uh, so what if we start thinking about how you build out a valuable portfolio that's permanent, that's perpetual? All right, and if you do this, then you can stop thinking about exits totally. I'm not buying a company because they might get sold in 10 years. I'm not buying a company because they're going to go and I, uh, do an IPO in 10 years. I'm buying a company because I think they're a good company and I would love to see what happens to them in the next 100 years. It's very different. I've never heard of that in any investing uh, community I've ever been in right, around the world um, with, with rare exception. There was one, one I joined, one, one investment I made because they had that idea. All right, so here's an example. Here's a real world example out of my life on what this means, because it's a little subtle. All right, so Fledge is my accelerator, uh, and we invested in 105 startups so far, 27 countries, lots, lots of places. Uh, and we've been using revenue-based equity for that. Uh, specifically, in this case, 
we did 27 investments in Africa, all in the food and ag industry, right? Plus others, right? There's another, you know, uh, what was that 60, 60 uh, 70 more companies uh, around the world, but there's 27 in food and ag. And our goal, what we, what we told our investors that we would do with their money is return, you know, two X or more. It's a VC fund. And we told them it would take 10 years. It might take 12 or 15 because successful VC, VC funds actually take 12 or 15. Um, but, you know, we promised them a two X return. We promised that these companies would buy us out. All the stuff I just told you about in the last half. All right. And so what do we do? What do we do to make that happen? Well, we brought these companies through an accelerator. We provide them advice. We introduce them to funders all the time. We talk to them about how they grow their revenues because we get paid on revenues. And ultimately we want to not own these companies that there, we didn't until, until recently. Uh, on all other investments, we, yeah, we want to not own those companies, right? which is the aim of every VC, not to, not to own companies. Now here's what we've done in the middle of a pandemic. We've instead taken to these 27 companies specifically, right? All of them have gone through a fledge program somewhere. And we took them out of fledge and we swapped all that ownership from fledge to this new thing called Africa Eats, which is a holding company. It is a permanent perpetual investment holding company. So what does Africa Eats do that's different than fledge? Well, it will fund the companies. We already started doing this. Uh, we're out looking for more money. Uh, we're funneling money through the holding company to these 27 entities. We're still advising them. Um, we're still focused on revenue growth because that's a measure of success. But now we're not looking at revenue growth in terms of how fast can they grow so they can pay us back. We're just looking at how fast can they grow uh, given the resources we have? How fast can they grow given the resources of the team? If they're, if they're done growing, that's fine. They can just tell us that. We'll stop funding them. Um, we just make, they're, they're almost all profitable. Uh, they can keep running. We're, we're totally happy with that. They can grow as big as they want. We will help them do that. And the oddity here, the difference is that we're not looking for the companies to, to get acquired or go IPO. We're looking for the, for the holding company, for Africa Eats, to go public in the mid-2020s. We intend for Africa Eats to still own these companies in 2100 and 2200 and 2300, the year 2100. Like 100 years from now, if we don't own these 27 companies and more, and they're not all running, we'll be disappointed. Right? We want to own these companies forever. We like them. So once we had that mindset, the question is, how do you, well, what else can you do? And so... Once we have this mindset of, well, these are our companies, we, we're gonna own them forever. And just, be, we're minority stake owners. We, we don't control these companies. They have founders. Uh, we're just helping those founders grow. Right? We, we own no more than a third of these companies. Um, so we wanna help them grow. We wanna support them and we want them to support each other because they're now all connected through this, through this holding company. So this is a graph of what we did. It looks like a total mess and a little bit of modern art, but this is what it looks like. It's 27 founders across 27 companies. And so we've connected them. We've officially connected them on board of directors where they're, they're serving on each other's boards and helping each other. And they're looking for synergies and they're providing up to the little team that runs this company uh, ideas on how we can serve them better. Uh, we're rolling out solar power next, next month because they need it. And as a VC, that seems like a crazy thing to do. It's like, we should find them a solar lender is something I, I would do with my fledge hat on. But as the Africa Eats CEO, it's like, no, forget that. Well, let's just do it. We will just put in solar on their buildings because it's useful for the next 20, 30, 40 years, right? It will pay for itself. And we'll just have them buy it out at let's say 0% interest because we can, because it's best for everyone if we don't extract too much money out of these companies. So let's do it at 0% interest leases. So we're uh, rolling that out in the next week or two. It's a very, very different model. Uh, I love this model. It's awesome. I, I, hope, I hope there's many, many copycats of this. I can't find another one that's doing this in the same way we are. Um, it's not a new model. We didn't make it up. There's a few things in here that we're doing that, that I haven't seen elsewhere, but the idea of a permanent hold co, well, it's been done for a long time. Berkshire Hathaway, it's the, uh, this isn't accurate anymore, but it's close. One, two, three, four, five. I think it's the sixth or seventh most valuable company in the United States, public company, the United States. 
right? So back in 2017, it was worth half a billion, half a trillion dollars. It's a little bit more than that now. What is it? It is a holding company. They own companies. This is a picture of the, of the companies they own. Uh, to pick one out here that most people around the world probably know is Duracell. Duracell is not an independent company. It is a subsidiary of Berkshire Hathaway. It was purchased a long time ago by is Warren Buffett's company. It was purchased by Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, 100%. It's 100% owned by this company, by, by Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, it's run by a separate management team. It's run as if it were an independent company. Berkshire Hathaway is kind of the, the it's the holding company, owns it. It provides them with whatever they need to grow. But uh, uh, it's just part of the, part of the you know, just one more of the companies in here. Uh, there's a candy company. There's a company that makes underpants and t-shirts. Uh, this is a railroad. This is an insurance company. These guys make floors. There's a lot of companies in here. And then they own some public companies too. They own some pieces of public companies. Uh, and that first venture capital fund I was talking about, uh, American Research and Development back in 40 something um, that this guy started, George Durrell. Uh, it was in fact structured as a permanent capital holding company. It was a public company. Any American could invest in American Research and Development. They could buy shares today. They could sell them tomorrow if they didn't like it anymore. They could sell them whenever they wanted. That's that separation between the timeline of investors and the timeline of startups. So the timeline of investors, it varies from investor to investor. So when you get to be a public holding company, which we aim to do, all of a sudden the investment can come in whenever it makes sense for the investor and they can leave whenever they want, right? It's public shares. They can sell them, you know, uh, nine, to, nine to four most days of the week, depending on the market. Um, and then more investors can come in later. And so uh, it's very, very different. It's a very different paradigm. So I'll leave you with, uh, just we'll have a few, a few minutes for questions here, but I'll leave you again with this book. Which I highly recommend everybody reads about paradigms. Uh, and two more books. The one on the left exists. You can go buy it. It has more details. The one on the right at the moment is just a cover. I, 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 I want another few years of experience before I write up how to actually do it. But it made the cover. I have a lot of books. Uh, and that is my story about California capitalism. There's people here. All right, so I can finally see the crowd. Uh, who wants to jump in and ask a question? Hi, Lumi, this is Marcy. Um, I, I may have missed this in your presentation, but could you just quickly go through um, you know, the advantages, the pros and cons of the revenue-based loans versus the revenue-based equities? Ah, great. Yes. Um, mostly comes down to taxes. So at least in the United States, I'm American. I live here in the States. Uh, when, a, a, when a company pays its own taxes, it can deduct the interest that's owed on a loan. That's a tax deductible expense. And so if you are investing in a company and, uh, and it's profitable and it's paying taxes because it, it's, it's profitable for a while, then it can have a benefit of lowering the cost of the loan because the, the interest is um, deductible. Uh, so somebody should get a tax, someone should, should take advantage of the tax system for this. Uh, on the other hand, I, I tend to invest in really early companies that are not yet profitable or, or barely profitable. And uh, in the United States, the lowest tax rate you can pay is for capital gains. So if we buy equity and they buy it back, that's a capital gain. So we get to pay a lower tax rate on our, on our investment if we do capital gains. Whereas if we get paid the interest from a loan, that's just income. That's the highest tax rate. I've seen this done with dividends to try and get something in between. It just gets too complicated. Um, and so that's one reason. The other one is I like to make a little bit more than 2x. I like the, up, the upside that I get for having them buy half my shares. I've seen three quarters done in some other deals I'm in uh, as an angel. Uh, and so I like that. I like the idea that I still own a little piece of the company for a while. Uh, and that's much easier to do as equity than, than loans, because if you do it as a loan, then you want to do warrants, and now you have more things to negotiate. How many warrants? What's the strike price? Do they expire in 10 years or longer? Uh, and so it's just simpler to uh, stick it as equity. 
Uh, Sankalp Zuma asked if we'll share the slides. Yes, um, actually uh, put them on the website, on my website, on, uh, on one of my web. Uh, right on. Uh, so everyone can find them. Where's the Zoom here? Uh, you can find them at the bottom of that post on my website. And whenever Sankalp puts out the video, which they said they'll do at some point, uh, I'll update that that page with uh, this video too. And I'm sorry we didn't get to do the whole workshop thing, but it's so hard to do over Zoom. You can see me do it on that on the video that's on that page. Uh, somebody privately just asked, is there an optimal number of companies for the Holdco? Uh, more than three. I don't know if there's a maximum. Clearly, at some point, it gets to be unwieldy. Uh, when I did my research on holding companies, what I found is that they've been holding companies that that structure has been around for a long time. It's been used a lot. It's tend to, it tends to get used by the private equity firms. If you don't know the difference, a capital P, capital E, private equity, those are companies that tend to buy majority ownership of companies, and private equity, little p, little e, like VC firms, buy minority stakes of companies. So the holding company is most often used by private equity funds to buy up whole companies. It's often, uh, what I've seen in Africa is they'll buy two or three or four companies. And then what has happened uh, too often is one of those companies has faltered for some reason and it has taken down everything with it. So uh, you need diversity in order to, to um, weather the storms like a pandemic and, and a flood and, uh, and locusts. Uh, and so I don't know what the minimum is. We just happened to do 27 because we have 27. Um, when I first wrote this plan, we had, I think it was 17. That seemed like enough at the time, um, but 27 is better. When I write the book, we'll, we'll try and figure that out. Hi. Yeah, Penelope? Um, Penelope Carruthers, um, based in Scotland, which with lockdown is really awkward because we're really London centric in the UK. If you want investments, you have to go down to London, you have to go around and meet people and try. It's the only way you can meet venture capitalists. They don't yeah, like same, to travel. Same here. I did five companies and every time we flew down to California to go get money. Mm -hmm. Is there, with COVID, is there any move towards making this more virtual and um, less um, country boundaries because my technology, though invented in Scotland and designed for Scottish rivers, the tax system here is toxic for new hydro and the biggest markets are Africa and Asia. Yeah, so um, that's a longer answer. We're actually, out of, I need to end this. The sun cup's not telling me this, but my, my time's up. So I will, I will answer you this way. Um, there's, uh, what I do for a living is to help entrepreneurs. And in doing that, I wind up creating ecosystem, creating infrastructure. Um, and so you look at, come look at my whole profile on LinkedIn. You'll see I do a whole bunch of things. Um, this model that you have to have people on the ground in order to invest in a company, total bunk. Uh, I've invested in 27 companies countries and I haven't been to all of them yet. Um, total bunk. It's totally possible to do it in other ways. Um, uh, we did burn a lot of jet fuel in the last eight years bringing people uh, to, to certain cities, but we did it. Uh, and we're happy with, with the investments we made. Uh, so I think what we're seeing in the pandemic is yes, you can certainly do things virtually that people didn't think you could do before. You can make investments despite the fact you didn't meet the people face to face. You can work in countries that you never set foot in. Um, that's all possible. Uh, it's not always it's not always possible using the obvious, straightforward manner that's been done before. So if there's anything I've learned from all my work uh, for almost 30 years in startups is that the obvious first solution is usually the wrong solution. That usually doesn't work. It's usually something off to the side that's outside the paradigm, like I just showed you that is actually the answer. And not enough people break paradigms. So I think that's a good place to end for the day.
If anyone wants to reach me, you can do that on the, um, whatever the system's called, on uh, Umbrella. Uh, and I will be, despite the fact that I'm way behind you on time zones, I will be up for the next like six hours. Uh, it's 11 p.m. where I am. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you all for, for, uh, for coming by.